why don't we, why don't I join you and we will start by asking yourself, uh, asking you to introduce yourself. Dov, why don't you start? Tell us <laughs> the most embarrassing, embarrassing thing which happened to you in your life. <laughs> I'm Dov Moran. Pleasure coming here. Pleasure being with you. You'll see on another oh, but panel. What, what, what are you doing? Dov, I will tell you, he's very shy. <laughs> Well, uh, uh, I'm the one officially uh, the guy invented. No, 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 no. You have to put a little bit of drama. drama. Dove created a product that each one of you has at least one piece of it. If I'm wrong, if, if the product which he created, every person in the world who has a computer usually has one of his Products. How many pieces of these mysterious products were sold so far? I, I tell you, if they have only one piece of that, that's a problem. No, 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 but uh, thought that what is the total number? You I, I didn't follow. I stopped following up. It's uh, probably tens of billions. Uh, tens of billions of products. He billions, invented billions. it. Pardon? Of billions, not billions. Of billions. <laughs> uh, anybody want to guess what is the product? Jeff, you want to guess what is the <laughs> product? I know the product. This is why I ask you to guess. <laughs> <laughs> USB. <laughs> USB stick? USB I was, stick. I was he the lucky guy created the, the first USB iPod. stick. <laughs> at least, at least you have, demo you have to demonstrate a little bit of enthusiasm. I know yeah. it's Monday morning, <laughs> but nevertheless. Steven. Uh, <laughs> this is the tough part to follow. I don't have tens of billions of something that I've invented. I'm more of a scaling guy, so I've spent my whole career outside the US, 26 years outside the US, either in Europe or Asia trying to help build tech companies. Now I work with Singapore government, and we're trying to figure out how to strike the balance between enough, not enough, and so that's what we're trying to learn, how to be a good teammate, and that's why we're excited to always learn also from Israel. Anybody was in Singapore, raise, uh, visited uh, Singapore, raise your uh, hand. Anybody who haven't been so far in Singapore, raise your hand. All, guys, we are going to close the, the, if you are not cooperating, we are going away. <laughs> <laughs> who was, who were, how you say, was, where, where? where? Who were in Singapore? Raise your hand. Who were not in Singapore? Raise your hand. Keep your hand up. <laughs> From those who haven't been in Singapore, who is going to Singapore in June to the unbound of Singapore? Raise your second hand. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Sol. Um, hi, I'm Saul. I uh, live in London. Uh, I've lived in Israel. I've been an entrepreneur with Love Film and Skype and Seed Camp and an investor for the last eight years at Index and now started a new seed fund in London. With Seed Camp and uh, Index and what you have done and your family, etc., how many startups you helped to build, to create, to develop? to flourish in your lifetime? About one quarter as many as you have. No, no, about no, really, 500. really. <laughs> How many, including? Probably about 500. 500. This guy affected the life of 500 companies. These guys are sleeping. <laughs> Do you know the guy next to you? Can you introduce him? I love this guy. <laughs> Sure you love this I guy. Love made this money guy. for you in 14 I met months. I him because right? of you. <laughs> no, in less than 14 months. Since you invested in him until the company was sold to eBay, how many months passed? Uh, about five years. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, this uh, AL, he can introduce himself. He's probably yeah. one of Israel's best, best entrepreneurs of his best, generation. Best, brightest, and most loved. Guys. Most loved, for sure. <laughs> best and, and brightest, you know. That's oh, easy. Yeah. Say. <laughs> okay, Jeff, go on. Eyal, Eyal, <laughs> since, since, uh, since uh, Sol invested in, uh, in the gift project until the company was sold to eBay, how many months passed? Oh, how many? A year or so? Yeah, 12 months. Yeah. Less than 12 months, I think. That was history. So history, any, okay, what uh, you are doing now? Who are you? Anyway, I'm, I'm Eyal Gora, pleasure to be here. I'm currently the chairman of Zebra Medical Vision. We are trying to unlock the value in uh, clinical data. So we curated access to over 100 million uh, patients' files, and we are letting a community of researchers to create uh, meaningful algorithms, initially in the field of radiology, and later on every algorithm that relates to healthcare that can improve people's life and can help the diagnosis of the next 1 billion people that are joining middle class by 2020. And this is your venture number? Five. Five. 
And now, this piece of work. Who are you? I'm Jeff. <laughs> you are Jeff. I'm not going to ask you to do... Not last year, you have done... Uh, years ago I did. Two years ago, you have push-ups. Yeah. Not what th happened to you when you made push-ups? The last, the last push-up you've done. Uh -huh. oh, the last push-up was off. Uh, I had a seizure last year. You yeah. tried to push yourself up. Too hard, yeah. Yeah. Jeff just recuperated from one year of some issues which he overcome, health issues. Yes. Can I tell them really what the health issues? Or Go ahead, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> he broke his, he broke his, uh, his shoulder. His shoulder from over-exercising. Sort of. And uh, his, uh, this is your first, no, you already traveled abroad. Uh, this is my second trip, well, second trip. Second trip, he came especially to see you, meet you, and speak to you. So this is our wonderful panel, and now, guys, we have to find an interesting topic. Which, uh, <laughs> So the management wants us to speak about uh, innovation and about moonshot projects and about not so moonshot <coughs> uh, project. Dov, you created uh, also you you created how many companies in your life, or you helped to build? Involved in the uh, tens. Ten. Tens. Ten. Tens. Twenty. Present tense or past tense? <laughs> uh, some are of the past, some are, uh, many of them are present, and I hope that many are future. Okay, how you, how you wake up in the morning and you decide you want to, give, give us some examples of the things you are doing now, and tell us about the mechanics. You well, wake well, up in the all, morning, you, you go to, to make a shower, where you get the, how, how the innovation comes about? So, let me just quote myself, it's not tense of, once I created, these are things that I was involved in. Okay. I'm an investor now. I'm, not, uh, I'm still an entrepreneur, but I'm an investor. Uh, <coughs> how does it uh, come? <coughs> well, usually it comes from the fact that you are looking around, and there is something there that bothers you, and it shouldn't be there. It should be, uh, there should be a solution. But we are living with our problems. Let's say, you know, they are, they are there because they have to be there, and it's incorrect. And I'll use the example not for my life, but uh, from uh, Mobileye. Guys, everybody drives a car, and everybody uh, is, you know, get hit or, or, or in the dangers to be to get hit from time to time. And it seems like it has, it has to be like that. It doesn't have to be like that. And about uh, f 15 years ago, two guys came to my office and said, "We have a solution. We need to have a solution because that's a real problem. That's a guy from Mobileye." And, uh, and there is a solution. And the solution is like that, that today people that are using Mobileye or equivalent system in their cars have much less accidents than people that don't have it. And that's a huge, a huge thing in our life, in, in our world, to eliminate accidents and save people's life. That's a problem that came up by people that just drove a car and said, hey, there is a problem. I, when I do my, my SMS, there's a chance I'll hit somebody. Don't do your SMS while driving. But uh, uh, you generally, the problems exist all around. We just have to look around and isolate and then say, let's find a solution and find a solution. Very simple, right? And you are not going to tell us what is the solution. Every problem has its own solution. Solution is usually smart guys, a lot of energy, a lot of uh, uh, desire to really do it, <coughs> the capability or the, the, the capability to uh, withhold all the hurdles, all the problems, all the disappointments. It's always long way, it's always much longer than what we believe in. That's what what keeps you busy these days? Dov. What? What keeps you busy these days? Well, uh, I'm a, I like uh, technology. I like young guys uh, doing uh, amazing uh, technologies. So I'm, uh, I'm looking for interesting people, interesting ideas, uh, looking to improve the world, my part of doing something for the world. You know, giving, giving one, uh, one uh, USB stick to each person in the world is not enough. You have to do <laughs> it more. You have to do as much as you can. Okay, Steve, I know that you are spending the big part of your time now increasing the innovation scene or enhancing the innovation scene in, in Singapore, developing the country. 
Can you tell us uh, how you go about it in a nutshell? <laughs> uh, here's the biggest challenge that we face as Singapore, is trying to make sure that we can think bigger than we currently are able to. And the scenario is simple. Singapore went from a real tough environment in 64, 65 to where it is now. The problem with that is that we're now at this 99th percentile, which is to try and keep improving, keep innovating, keep stretching, is difficult because the downside is much greater than the upside. And so there's this fear of if we try something that's quite different and it doesn't quite work, then there is a long way to slide back. So this is the big challenge now, is how do we tackle very tough problems? So the things that we're trying to do, our equivalent of a moonshot, is to think about things that also affect everybody in the room. An aging population, increasing urban density, and the implications. What does it mean for transportation? What does it mean for health, for food, for resources? And if we can bring the startups and the corporates and the government and the investors into some sense of shared priorities. This is not government trying to prescribe the outcome or trying to push any particular agenda as much as it's trying to learn how to be more open to some of these ideas. Regulation plays a role, policy, legislation. So government can help by trying to be in an environment in which some of this is made more possible. It doesn't mean do it. So the private sector, things like autonomous vehicles, rely on understanding what's in front of the vehicle so that people can adopt that new technology. But there's the insurance implication and so on. So this is what Singapore is trying to do, is to learn how to make big leaps. In 65, 68, 70, the downside was much less, so the willingness to take a big risk was much higher. Now it's inverse, and we're trying to learn how to do that. And what about the old saying which says, if it works, don't fix it? This is I visited Singapore. I was amazed. One level of, of administration. You know, in every country you have a borough, a city, a county, a state, and then a a government, like five levels of bureaucrats in Singapore, they have only one level of administration, one level. The government is the city, is the borough, is the county, is everything. So maybe think smaller is more efficient than think bigger. Ironically, if you look at some of the Global Innovation Index, smaller countries always rank more highly. So constraint can be a positive. And so what we're trying to do is learn how to withdraw, potentially withdraw from the system some of the support, because sometimes like putting too much water in a plant is just as bad as not enough water for a plant. So we have historically tried to put a lot of support into the system. We're trying to see if we can be better at withdrawing some support and having some of that constraint also be a positive. Good, where is Danny? Danny? He went, Danny Seal. <laughs> Anthony, you are here? Nobody. Okay, we will, we will, they, you know, they opened the thing and they went away from the... <laughs> Sol Klein, what is the, out of the hundreds of companies you affected, what is the one you are most proud of? Ooh, I hate when I'm asked this question. <laughs> um, I, I mean, that's a really, it's, it's an impossible question, but I mean, some... Okay, thank you, Sol Klein. <laughs> I, was, I was about to tell ah, okay, you the okay. company <laughs> called... Uh, the one I've, I've sort of most interested and excited in in the last 18 months is a company... What is the company you are most excited in the last 18 months? Improbable. Improbable. Mm -hmm. um, it's a company in London um, that is basically creating the opportunity for people to simulate at, at scale um, worlds or environments. The first application for it is, is in the gaming area. The more interesting and most interesting applications are at the city and country and the, at the system level because you know, when you're dealing with the kind of challenges that we, we've just heard, whether it's at, at a Singapore level, whether it's at a a UK level, um, you know, we're all very complex 
systems and the way that we interact with one another, you know, as, as humans, even without autonomous vehicles, as, you know, cellular systems, you know, these are very, very complex. And I think it's unbelievably exciting that we're living in an era now where technology can help us actually run, you know, massive simulations, which will allow us to sort of understand some of the consequences of our planning and our behavior. So I, I think the idea is very exciting. It's very early, but actually the thing that excites me the most is that this is happening in London because, you know, the fact that there is an entrepreneur who is building something like this in London, who hired 50 developers to build something like this in London, who you know, managed to win investment. I think he got Andreessen as a Series A and some very, very interesting investors from, from Asia as, as his Series B. Um, to me means that you know, we're now living in an era where radical ideas, radical thinking can come from anywhere, even London. Even London. Even London. Even London. Even London. This and I, is from I say the people that in who all invented seriousness. railroads, shipping, uh, the steam engine, etc. And now he's proud that they invented it's something. It's game on again for London. It took us 150 <laughs> years to recover, but we're back. <laughs> Are you invested in this company? So I was lucky enough to be a seed in So you should, you should have disclosed that you are about to do shameless uh, propaganda. You know? Well, you asked of the companies <laughs> I'm involved That's in. That's true. So you preempted my shameless propaganda. <laughs> That's a good point. Very good. Uh, Eyal, you are now, you told us that you are kind of putting together a number of technologies, big data, image process processing as it relates to, to health. Health is always being counted as one of the major, major areas which is going to benefit from this revolution. I'm hearing it for the last 45 years. So far it was fulfilled par partially, let's say this is. What do you see in the health space speaking about Moonshot and great ideas in the next 10 years. So, so for me, it's still a very humbling process of uh, learning. Uh, it's, uh, I thought of the zebra idea many years ago. I started to try to uh, aggregate all those data pieces uh, three years ago, and only six months ago we were able to put a research plan platform on top of all those millions of files. So it took a while. And uh, Comparing it to the other companies we mentioned, like the GIFT project or companies like PickScout and Pickup that w I was involved before, this is a very long time. So we, we just started and we al already spent four years of hard work. And healthcare, with healthcare, you have uh, like a four or five way marketplace. You have the insurers, the consumers, uh, the patients, uh, the Not regulator, uh, the startup itself. Um, and every once in a while other corporates that may be involved. And you need to, as a startup, to fine tune yourself all the time between all those uh, parties. So everything is much, much more complex. And uh, we are trying to bring a notion of things we learned in uh, the other vertical of tech, like uh, something like App Store, something like Open Innovation, something up like uh, sharing data. Um, and it also needs to be very, very... Uh, curated because you have the privacy issues and the other legal issues. So it took a while to solve all those and we were just in the beginning. But Moonshot project, um, I, I'm not sure if Moonshot is already the definition because all, so many companies are now moonshotting and you have a bazaar downstairs, it's called Startup Bazaar. Uh, so you have all those companies that are now easily creating an app by connecting few APIs together and creating an app that they can use by a third party that is, does it for them. So. It's, it's, it got so much easier to, to get into the tech world, so now we should call it like Pluto shot or Sun, <laughs> sun shot. <laughs> um, so those projects of uh, trying to solve healthcare or farming <coughs> or bring more education uh, to places in the world that are impossible, not because of the technology, because of the bureaucracy or the politics, um, those are moonshots. Thank you. Uh, in Israel, they usually applaud when somebody is finishing, you know. 
even, even <laughs> if it was a total bullshit, just to give him encouragement, you know. Uh, Jeff, speaking about moonshots, you were really at the cradle of an industry which 20 years was very obscure one, and uh, people looked at it more, I think, as a, as a technology gag than a real industry, and yet it developed to something uh, serious. Can you, just as a case study, as a demonstration for a real uh, moonshot which affects the world, can you do a rapid, a rapid timeline of voice over IP, and can you start with how voice over IP saved your life? Okay, um, we'll take a couple of minutes, let's see. Voice over IP was a core technology actually uh, created an IDF in Israel in 1980. In the 1980s, it was a top secret technology used for Air Force pilots. I first started using it uh, in 1995, a small company in Herzliya, commercial, a few people in the early 90s were trying to commercialize voice over IP, although we were calling it <coughs> internet telephony back then, and a small company called Vocal Tech got it right in February 1995. My background in the 70s, I was a ham radio operator, I don't know if anyone here knows amateur radio. But um, it was my way of growing. My first social network was ham radio. It was where I grew up. It's where I found friends. Where I connected. He was a nerd like me. <laughs> and what we have done, we <laughs> retreated. We retreated, you say? How you say? Retreated, yeah. To ham radio because we, afraid, we were afraid to speak to girls. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> this is very true. In fact, we had, I, had, I had no friends. My friends I found on the radio. Um, <laughs> it was just hard. But it, it, it's, it's where I grew up. And so... My social network in, as a teenager up into cut through university was ham radio. And just in 1995, when I heard about the software being available, I downloaded it. And, and, and an amazing thing was, this is on dial-up internet, it worked. And about 20% of the people who were online, in 1995, the internet had about 16 million people. So back then, uh, about 20% of the people using the software we're using their ham radio call signs as their identifier. Because all the people who went to, inter to the internet were nailed like us. So, so it, what was awkward also was that we were, I was pretending to be on the radio while talking over the internet using the software. So it was a little weird, but I got used to it fast. And, and what I built by accident was a community. I was working on Wall Street at the time. You were not working. You were paid salary, but you were yeah. now, on true. this shitty voice over IP. <laughs> this is true. Well, luckily, um, it, I, I got fired. <laughs> so it, and, and it did, and it saved my life. The best thing happened to him. It's cause I, because I discovered this technology, um, a couple of things happened. One was, in the se when I was a ham operator, one of the things I used to do was phone patches. So I don't know if any of you ever saw reruns of the TV show MASH, but I was Radar O'Reilly. I was a person connecting the radio and the telephone together. Whenever anyone, friends from overseas... I illegally. Illegally, 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 whatever. Um, I, I was the one connecting to letting people communicate from overseas into the States. And, um, Illegally. <laughs> and uh, I started something called Free World Dial-Up, where uh, and maybe there are people here in the room that actually were part of it, but it, back in 1995, I did something which went viral on the internet, which when you only had 16 million people, it was easy. Um, and basically, I created a system with some friends who, which enabled people with two modems in their computer to, make, to enable free phone calls for the rest of the world. Was it legal? Illegal, maybe. Illegal. But, uh, <laughs> but it he's worked. A, he's a criminal, actually. <laughs> uh, maybe. Uh, anyway, free will dial up helped challenge the status quo because at that point there was no regulations in America for people offering free phone service. No one ever thought it'd be, cra be crazy enough to order doing something for free. So I launched the world's first free internet telephony network. Anyway, this created a lot of bureaucracy. I ended up. Uh, creating a trade association, which still exists today, which was called the Voice on the Net Coalition, the Von Coalition, which kept for nine years voice over IP free in America. Um, I got fired from my day job because the New York Times in, in, in uh, 1996 wrote a story about me at the same time the CEO of the company I was working for was profiled um, because there was some fighting at the company I worked for. And luckily I got fired because three and a half years later, uh, the company I worked for lost 700 people on 9-11. 400 of those people um, I knew, and I'm very grateful for being fired. And so it, it's voice over IP that literally saved my life. And uh, I, I was very fortunate to be early, early. So when I first downloaded the software, what I recognized was that voice one day would be an application, not a service, and that people would be free 
to be able to talk to each other without service providers. That was the big aha. And so what I did accidentally, and I say it accidentally because I had no real, I, I can't take credit for what I did, because not because I didn't do it, but because I didn't know I was doing it at while. Can you tell us it. about your effect on the industry, the Vaughn uh, conferences, etc.? I, I, I think I, if anyone here ever used FaceTime, Skype, Snapchat, any type of service, any of you use any of these services? Uh, and, and any of you pay for FaceTime and stuff like that? You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I did. He, he created also the first uh, industry forum, the first industry show, and he took all these obscure hobbyists. They even were not entrepreneurs. They were they're, hobbyists. They're hobbyists. And consolidate them to Look, I, big I, I, industry. I, I, I have to tell your story because you are so poor in telling your own <laughs> story. It's a shame. He fought, he fought the U.S. government, he fought the big telcos, right? I did. You got the legislation, what is this legislation called? The pulver order. Yeah, the pulver order. Wh which states that any voice communication that starts on and, the and he spent And he spent his life for vain because this voice over IP didn't go anywhere, right? Well, it went somewhere, it changed the way the world communicates. Yeah, now uh, what percentage of international calls is being done on on voice over IP? Almost all of them. Almost all of them. Yeah. Okay, so here you have a guy who have done a moonshot against his own will. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Thank you. Okay, this, these were the opening remarks, so you will know with whom you are dealing. And now <laughs> we open the real session, which we have five minutes for questions and answers <laughs> from the audience. So you have a microphone over there, right? You have a roving microphone. Anybody has a question? Dan Moscovich doesn't have a question because he's doing emails all the time. Yes, yeah. please. But you need to get the microphone. Can you bring this gentleman here, microphone? By the way, anybody who, who doesn't hear me because he's doing emails right now, can you raise your hand, please? <laughs> <laughs> So here's the quick answer on this one. I always try and look at Singapore as a context. So when there's no natural resources in the island, there's communist insurgency in the oh, 60s, and there's a variety of things, there has to be a certain set now, of responses. That was then, this is now. So Singapore is much more focused on how does it continue to move forward, how does it continue to innovate. There's a big move in universities, big move in the ecosystem. What we're trying to do now is be connected to other parts of the world in a way that we can partner. So the important thing, and without having met Saul, I'll also put in a plug, and I am a neutral party because I'm not invested. I had dinner with the CEO of Improbable last week because this idea of operating the city as a giant OS is something that we're interested in learning more about. So this just is a case of where there's common interest and there's a closing of the circle to do something really important. So I think. Right now, Singapore is focused on what can it accomplish as it looks ahead as a partner to the rest of the world. Good, thank you. I'll throw something in. You, you have a question. Well, a comment. How many people yeah, here? He have an answer, and then we will ask what is the question. So the Go qu ahead. question <laughs> is, how many people here get ideas by taking in the shower? That's it? Come on, 5%. You guys. No, no, first uh, you have to, to how see many the real person. How many ah. take a shower? Ah. How many take a shower? <laughs> oh, I understand. So, so because I, I always got my ideas from the shower. and I, when How often you get ideas? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was thinking about big ideas, and what I never figured out about corporate culture was how come there were no showers at work? How come, how come we had to get our ideas before we went to work, but when we went to work, we had to just get stuff done? Why couldn't we create an environment where we're creative all the time? Because if you want to change the world, sometimes we have to change the way we address the world. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to advocate for more showers. <laughs> more showers or and, more showers in the workplace? More showers in the work, well, thinking anyway. At least getting people, giving people an opportunity to think while they do stuff, 
rather than having to go to work just to make stuff happen. Mm -hmm. You know how you save water? The two people are taking the shower simultaneously. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Anybody want to ask the question that this was the answer to? <laughs> okay, we have uh, room for one more question. Yes, you are the closest, so we'll give you the benefit. Can you introduce yourself? From where? Which country? From which country? Turkey. Turkey. Yeah, Turkey. A round of applause for Turkey. <laughs> How much time it took from the invention to the... <coughs> okay, so uh, L Systems uh, was created, the company who actually brought to the market the USB flash drive was created much before to do USB flash, to do in general flash data storage. The whole idea of the USB flash drive came from a need. And talking, answering your question, uh, maybe inventions comes when you are insecure and unorganized, yes? When you are really organized, it's difficult to innovate. The concept I was, I went to a conference like that, went with my computer, my computer was dead, standing in front of 200 people with uh, no presentation to present while you are a public company and can't miss the numbers, uh, is a problem. And uh, uh, I, I, I felt terrible. I'm, I'm you know, standing and just being, uh, being there with such a situation. And somehow it worked. But I, when I finished the presentation, I say, this is, I have to change. I have to be in a position that wherever I'll go, I'll have my presentation in my pocket so I can plug it to any computer and I can present. Uh, so here came the idea. And then, OK, is it feasible? How? Clearly, I knew about use. You have to know technology. You have to understand technology to invent. Don't believe on inventing without uh, knowing anything, yes? Uh, we knew USB is coming to the market sometime. But USB did not support memory. No one thought at the USB committee that memory will be stuck. And we were lucky because these guys were not smart enough to figure out that you can plug memory into USB. So OK, what the next thing you do? You write a patent. We wrote a patent. Patent is very crucial. When you invent, write patents. Cover it from, from every angle you can cover it, if, if it's possible. If not, think again whether it's, it's a product. And then, uh, I think it was about a year, a year and a half of development. And then again, many hurdles. Uh, Dell said this is uh, not going to succeed. Uh, I was uh, brought it on the first time on a conference in Israel. And most of the viewers thought it's a joke. And the price was very, very high. And the, the, the capacity initially was 8 megabytes. 8 megabytes? Come on. Flo 8 megabytes for $50. Floppy, these days, cost 50 cents. How can you compare? Uh, but, so you claim, hey, but the price of this is going to go down. Prove us. Uh, OK, we proved them. We sold them uh, the, the next generation we sold while losing $10 per each unit. We lost 10, and every time, and then we got an order from Sony of 10,000 products, 100,000 products, and I said, wow. From one side, you know, hey, it's Sony ordering from us. On the other side, hey, I'm going to lose a million dollars, yes? <laughs> uh, what's better? Uh, so it's a long hurdle. It's a long hurdle. It takes time, but it's worthwhile. Ladies and gentlemen, Dobbs, Steven, Sol, Eyal, and Jeff, thank you very much. <laughs>